lot of people, you know, a lot of people ask us why did the World Bank choose this topic of uh, for, for this WDR? And actually, we were not given the topic of risk management. We were given the topic of crises and and risk. But after thinking about it for a little while, we, we decided that we thought that risk management was really the more interesting question. Why is it that societies are, are doing so poorly? And how can it be scaled up? So hopefully, um, we've, Kyla has convinced you now that risks are important to development and that that managing them well is easier said than done. So what can really be the way forward in terms of scaling up risk management in poor countries, including countries with low capacity? I think, first of all, we really need to realize that a lot of risks are beyond the means of individuals to deal with on their own, that uh, some risks are just too large. They just overwhelm uh, individuals and families. Or, uh, and, and this, by the way, is, is very often health shocks when you ask poor people. Um, they, they will often point to, to a health shock as something that, 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 that has bankrupted them. Systemic shocks, natural hazards or financial crises and so on, uh, are also clearly beyond the means of families. And as are multiple shocks that occur in, in, in sequence. So that, that's why we see risk management very much as a shared responsibility. It's something that you cannot just point and say it's, it's the families or it's the states or it's or it's somebody's responsibility. You, you cannot do that. It, it has to be this notion of something that's shared. But when it's shared, it's also difficult, obviously. You get into the collective action problems as one of the obstacles that, that Kyla mentioned. We propose to take this forward through this holistic approach to risk management, where we, we see collective action and institutions as really critical in taking risk management forward. And the particular things that have to be done depend on what systems and what risks you talk about. So different systems perform different functions, the household, the enterprises, the communities, the state, and so on and so forth when it comes to risk management. But everybody play a crucial role. And, and we'll come back to how those roles are different uh, in each case. But on a little bit of on a philosophical note, uh, you might even, uh, you, you can even say that the, the that risk management is a key motivation for forming groups and institutions in the first place. You come together because you have something, a larger threat that you need to collaborate on. Larger threat or a larger opportunity. We illustrate this with, the, with this chart. We call it the onion chart. The notion here is that the individual is in the center. So risks to people are in the center here. This is different from, say, a lot of the business literature, which will put risks to enterprises in, in the center, or risks to a country. Here, in, in throughout the report, it's risks to people, to individuals that are at the center. And, and the logical first layer is then the family as really the first line of defense. And then it expands outwards with community, the enterprise sector, the pri and the, all of the private sector, in fact, the state and the international community. And all have a crucial role to play for, for risk management. But the state is critical in this. And, and I want to <laughs> highlight this. Uh, <coughs> Alison, you wrote about the role of the state uh, 15 years ago. And, right. and, and, but it's still being discussed very <laughs> much. And, 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 and I'm, I'm compelled to say that, that some people, when they flip through the, uh, the table of contents and, and the chapter titles here, they, they, they come to us and they ask, but we don't see the state mentioned in any of the chapters. Does this mean that we, we disregard the state? No, we do not disregard the state. We see the uh, only governments have really the scale to manage systemic risks, to provide the enabling environment, meaning getting the incentives right, so that people you know, don't impose risks on others and <coughs> do what they're supposed to. And also to support vulnerable people directly, right? So we see this threefold role of the state. Um, that's illustrated here with the pressure on wages, and that, that can seem really overwhelming. But hopefully, the governments can come and save us or save the wages. And we illustrate the same point in another way here. People's risk management is at the top. That's the objective. That's, that's what, we've, what we're trying to improve. And the state plays crucial roles through policy and direct support and public goods and so on and so forth. 
And a lot of these things are direct, help people directly. But a lot of it is also about improving the ability of other systems, the enterprise sector, communities, and so on and so forth, to improve their ability to help people manage risk, to, to set the incentives right, to provide the public goods that will help others to provide risk management. And very importantly, we see the uh, role of the international community as backing up both of, both of these uh, dual tracks of risk management. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But it's important to realize that government failures are regrettably abundant. Um, again and again, uh, you see that a lot of the important risks come from governments, are created by governments, or people within government. And most clearly, of course, in fragile and conflict-affected states, but also in, in many other settings. And so, so I think this leads on to another set of discussions about how the role of civil society in the private sector and even the international community changes. Because then part of that role is not only to help people manage risk directly, but also to help the state become more accountable and more effective. So, 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 and so we discussed that at, at some length, how, for example, how civil society can help put pressure on governments, including local governments, which, which really fail a lot in, in a lot of places, to, to provide services and public goods in a way that's more accountable to the risks that citizens face. So let us talk a little bit about the challenges and policies <coughs> uh, in each system. Uh, it's again with the larger objective of thinking through how risk management can be scaled up and, and, and what that means uh, in sort of more concrete terms. The, the family is, as I mentioned, the first line of defense, but has a lot of weaknesses, mm -hmm. including just insufficient risk sharing uh, across households, so it's hard to cope with a little bit larger shocks, and also the tendency to, um, to discriminate and, and not treat all members uh, of the family equally. Um, and, and, and as the slide mentions, health and income shocks are, are particularly problematic uh, for, for families to deal with. A lot of people uh, are, are not covered by health insurance, for example. The, heart, the tallest bar there is from East Asia and Pacific, but that's maybe 35% of people that have health insurance. Um, uh, uh, all the other regions, it's, it's a far, far lower. So you can think of policy reforms to strengthen families' ability to help people manage risks, such as health insurance. You can think of social protection that is uh, well-targeted, and so on. The next layer up in the onion uh, graph is the community, so small, local, informal groups. Their strength is their informality. Because of the informa informal nature of these things, there are no insurance contracts, right? Uh, it's sort of, you help me today, I help you tomorrow kind of a thing. And th that's what can make it work. That's the beauty of it. It's not rigid like how market systems are. It, they can, community structures can potentially deal with a lot of things that, that markets and enterprises and governments cannot deal with. But the informality is also their weakness because it makes it so hard to grow bigger and manage risks on scale. It becomes these very small local things and that's all beautiful at the local level, right? But there's just a lot of stuff that with an you know, larger shocks and more interconnected shocks in a globalizing world, there's need for risk management at ever larger scale, and community structures are inherently very weak at that. They're also not very good when it comes to long-term preparation, right? There might be a little bit of uh, insurance, small-scale insurance here and now, but, but investing collectively in major irrigation uh, or other major capital-intensive inten ventures, that, that becomes problematic for communities. So, so the, uh, this, this photo shows women in self-help groups in India. They organize savings and credit skills and business training. Um, and and there's sort of this, the photo is meant to illustrate this wonderful cohesiveness and energy that there can be at the local level. But sometimes, uh, and, and then this photo is from, from Malawi, it's a, a water project. Uh, some, some of this uh, infrastructure really needs government in investment and intervention, particularly if it's networked. So, so the, the types of policies that will strengthen community risk management have to do with public services, public infrastructure that's, uh, that, that's geared to the relevant local risks and uh, built in consultation with surrounding communities. We also have a chapter on the enterprise sector. 
uh, particularly on labor market issues. A, a, a lot of people were asking us, why are we discussing jobs and enterprises and labor markets in, in, a, in, a, in a book on risk? And the reason is that, I mean, look at it this way, at the end of the day, a, a decent steady job is ultimately the best risk protection that, that a family can have. And, and the problem is that far too many people work on their own. Um, <coughs> so so in, uh, this is the tall bars of South Asia and, and Africa, where 70 to 80 percent or even more are self-employed. So we're talking single person firms, we're talking no risk sharing, no labor sharing, uh, very low productivity. So, so, so there's just no risk sharing through work. And so the, we, we really need to think about business environments that promote firms' flexibility, but also growing formality and growing size in order to, to enable risk sharing through work. And, and this, this might be hard to read. A lot of countries have a long way to go in terms of promoting both flexibility and formality. Now, the financial system is, has, has become famous in, in recent years for creating risk and instability. A lot of people like to make jokes about it. But I mean, at the end of the <coughs> day, actually, its purpose was to provide risk management instruments to people. Um, of, of course, in, uh, in, cr in financial crisis, all the, the provision of, of credit falls dramatically. So suddenly people don't have these, uh, these tools available in a crisis, That's, which is exactly when they need them. So this instability is really a big problem that, that, that imposes huge risks on people. And so, uh, so many countries have had banking crises over the last four decades. Um, it's, it's on average, it's, it's more than one per country, and some, I think it's Argentina, ha might have had four, so around one per decade. So, uh, so, so we really need policies that promote uh, financial stability uh, through better regulation. But at the same time, that also promotes inclusion so that more people can have access to financial tools. S the, the, the issue as we see it is to get that trade-off right between stability and inclusion. The story is a little bit the same with the macroeconomy. So when there's a macroeconomic crash, uh, the provision of public services and public goods dries up. Suddenly, a lot of developing countries mm -hmm. will find that when, when the government uh, runs into fiscal trouble, then the safety nets are cut back and the, f the free health and education services are cut back. But in times of crisis, that's exactly when people need those services, right? So really the goal has to be more stable provision of, of these things, and you only do that through d better f uh, fiscal management. There's no other way. Um, and luckily a lot of developing countries actually are becoming better at that, so, 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 so things are far less volatile than they used to be. Think about Latin America in the 1980s, which was so famous for volatility, and that's not really the story today. So in, I, I, I guess there's been a, a sense of learning from past failures. Still, we feel that a lot of countries could do better on uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policy, more sustainable debt management. And we, we, um, we, 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 uh, we provide this notion of a fiscal council that will provide a little bit of an independent, more technocratic flavor to fiscal policy. So this chart shows how a lot of people are moving towards more counter-cyclical fiscal policy. The international community is ever more needed because with globalization, more and more risks cross countries, cross borders, and require coordination across borders. And more and more risks are, are so large that they threaten to overwhelm individual countries, and those countries then, then need help. But of course, uh, the international community has, is also disappointing in many ways, uh, most spectacularly when it comes to climate change, where with irreversibility and, and very uh, potentially catastrophic uh, damages, the, the, the inability to, to sort of act meaningfully um, is, is really disappointing to all of us. We say in the report, do not wait. For, for this big all-inclusive uh, agreement that will get all the countries to aligned. Ideally, that's what you want, but in the, in the interim, 
do, do move forward. Um, we talk about it as the coalitions of the willing. Those that are willing to act do not wait on, on others, but do move forward. But think about moving forward in coalitions that create incentives for others to join in and so to become gradually more inclusive. So for example, can you lower the, the, um, the cost of participation over time? To mainstream risk management, uh, there's really no silver bullet. We have so many specific policy recommendations. I didn't, don't want you to read it, just to emphasize that there are many. But, but more than anything, what is most important is that we, we think about uh, development a little bit different, <coughs> that we stop thinking about, about it as sort of a certain thing that you can just plan your way out of. Uh, really change and uncertainty <laughs> are fundamental, uh, are critical, underlie all modern economies. And so that has to be thought in. One way to ensure more systematic attention to risk management is through national risk boards, institutions that have as their objective to, to do risk management or to make sure that it happens. We, we propose a sort of a, some kind of apex government body. It, will not, it doesn't necessarily have to be a new body. It can draw on what's there already. And, and that, um, that considers the synergies and the trade-offs in addressing different risks so that you get more of an equal attention uh, across different types of risk. What you see in a lot of countries is that one risk will be taken very serious and, and then a and lot of action and then others will be neglected. So, so we would like to see that a little bit more equalized. We would like to also see a national risk board put pressure on those agencies that fail to do uh, proper risk management to a little bit counteract those political economy in incentives that Kyla was mentioning, to, to always think of the here and now and the response and, and forget about the, um, the long term and, and, the, uh, and the not so sexy long term risk management, right? <coughs> Somebody to, um, uh, to, uh, to really uh, counteract the, those always, uh, th those uh, incentives to, to um, to, to, to only think about response and not to think about risk management. It could combine advisory and implementation rules, and, and, and it could be designed in slightly different ways in different countries. Uh, clearly, uh, very low-income countries, countries with very low capacity, you cannot expect so much as you can in, in a place like UK and Singapore. So when we talk about risk management, we talk about a lot of different things and that applies to each system each risk, each country. But there are five principles that are, I that are common uh, and, and that you will see repeated throughout the report. The first one is to not have policies that generate uncertainty or unnecessary risks. So, so these are policy principles specifically to government. And so avoid making the problem larger is what we are saying here. Policies that promote gender inequality, ethnic favoritism, Avoid things like that. I mean, how many fragile countries, when, when you read up, up on their history, you'll see that uh, at some point in time, the government actually deeply upset one group uh, and, and that, that those, um, those feelings are still uh, fueling the conflict decades later. Expropriation of private assets is holding business growth back in a lot of countries. Second, provide the right incentives so that people can do their own risk management and, and financial bailouts that are sort of done in an ad hoc way uh, is a prime example of, of the wrong incentives that, that en encourage large banks to take uh, unnecessary risks um, is in, and, and then being able to be bailed out by taxpayers later. Keep a long run perspective. Um, think about how you can build institutional mechanisms that can transcend the political cycles. I like this one a lot because, because, because we know that the sort of human, human and political tendencies to, to be short term. So if you can think of a, some institutional mechanism that will promote the long term thinking at the level of the project or at the level of a ministry or at the level of all of government as in the National Risk Board, I think then you can really take risk management forward in a major way. Promote flexibility in everything you do. So, so you know that there'll be change and uncertainty, right? So think about the ability to respond, 
but do that within a, flex, a clear and predictable institutional framework. In the area of labor markets, you discuss the Danish flexibility system that has, that has been helpful in, in keeping um, uh, unemployment a little bit in check uh, back home in, in Denmark, where I come from. But, uh, and, and the finally, and also very, very important, is the principle of protecting the vulnerable. So some people are more exposed and less able to manage risks on their own and need well-designed safety nets that can target not just the chronic poor, but also those that are vulnerable during crisis, and so, so, so that are able to scale up during crisis. I encourage you to check out our websites. We have, uh, we have uh, videos, uh, <coughs> animated videos. It's not often you associate animation and, uh, with the World Bank, but we thought that this, this topic of risk management was so, was so abstract that we needed to, to, to illustrate it in very <coughs> concrete ways, that actually it's not really so abstract. There are some very good and very specific ideas behind it. That's what these videos do. And this is our website. You can download for free the entire report as well as individual chapters and see uh, interviews and, as mentioned, the videos. Thank you.